Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai. E hi aki ana, te atākura, he tiu, he huka, he hauhunga. Hau mi e, hui e, tai ki e. E ngā hau e whā o te motu, nau mai, tahuti mai ki te hui. Ko mihi ngā rangi tēnei, e mihi atu nei ki a koutou katoa. Welcome to the hui, Māori Current Affairs for all New Zealanders. E tarua ke nei. In 2019, a young mother vanished without a trace. She was seen walking to the river mouth by an eyewitness. Two years on, Jamie Kaiwe remains missing. What I can't accept is the lack of investigation surrounding her disappearance. Do you think police have done everything they could have done for this whānau? Yes, I do. Her whānau are convinced she's the victim of foul play. This is us, this is our grandchild missing. If it happened to you, would you let it go? The Hui revisits Jamie's disappearance and shares new revelations about her case. Kara hui hui mai. The Fano of Jamie Kaiwe are refusing to give up their search for the missing mum. Jamie vanished from Tolaga Bay in October 2019, and since then, no trace of her whereabouts has been found. Her family are convinced she's the victim of foul play, but police believe there's nothing suspicious about her disappearance. Later in the show, Jamie's cousin, Jonique Ole Alai Nuuesi, will join me in the studio with the latest updates on her case. But first, let's look back at the story we shared about Jamie four months after her disappearance. Kia tahuri ki tato. Jamie is a 27-year-old mother of one. Since she disappeared in October 2019, her grandparents, Eru and Elaine Kaiwai, haven't stopped looking for her. They live next to the Uawa River, which flows into Tolaga Bay with its iconic 600-metre-long wharf. Once a thriving township, Tolaga has seen better days. Many Fano have cut a track to the city. But Jamie did the opposite. Twelve years ago, when she was still a high school student in Rotorua, she reached out to her grandparents. I get a call. Nan, can I come and stay with you? I said, OK, if you can come and stay with me. So she came and finished off her high school at the local high school. It wasn't perfect, you know. <laughs> we were sure we had our, our rouse because Jamie is very um, strong-minded and she didn't like discipline. She rebelled against this, but she was good company, you know. Good company too for her cousin, Junik Uli Alainu'u Esi. They were born just days apart. And me and her were really close. Me and her and my sister we were all very close. And we stayed in contact quite a lot. She's a good mother and she's a really good heart, really genuine person. Did she always keep in touch with you guys? Well, yes, always. Yes, always. Always. Yeah. Yeah. She always came back to us. Yeah. She always came back to us. But in October 2019, Jamie didn't come back. She's been missing ever since. Now we, uh, we're looking for, for Jamie, Jamie Kaiway, 27-year-old female from Tolaga. Uh, we have discovered her vehicle in the um, car park at the, the wharf. So we haven't given up hope to, to find Jamie. Yeah, and we're really concerned, so let's hope that someone may be able to give us some information. But 10 days later, search and rescue stopped looking. Police telling the family Jamie's disappearance wasn't suspicious. There was no body, no suicide note, just a whole lot of unanswered questions. They said that she was seen at the end of the wharf, and that was it. They didn't say she jumped in the sea, but I suppose they wanted you to say that she went into the sea. It's a scenario that can't be ruled out. A year earlier, Jamie suffered a breakdown and was committed to hospital, losing the guardianship of her only son. We didn't know, eh, until that time, eh? They never a clue. You don't look for mental health, do you? Mm. It was never displayed. 
she was always very happy. Um, but it wasn't until probably the end of 2018 that it really took a turn for her, or that we noticed enough for me to be like, she needs to go to the hospital. That was when her first known psychotic episode happened. It's not known what triggered that episode, but the family were aware that Jamie was using cannabis. The police have said the case isn't suspicious. And I guess with her, you know, occasional drug use, um, with the mental health history, what is it about that that you can't accept? What I can't accept is the lack of investigation surrounding her disappearance. And that's because police didn't perform important procedures in the days after Jamie's disappearance. Firstly, they didn't secure a potential crime scene, Jamie's car. Nor was the car or the room where she lived tested for fingerprints. Instead, they formed the view Jamie's disappearance was unexplained. Can you accept that she may have just disappeared like that? No. There's got to be something else alongside this. Is it a feeling you have? Yeah. yeah it's a feeling, mm. yeah. Jamie had been living here at the Tolaga Bay Inn. She had a part-time job downstairs, working on a community project for small businesses. Those she worked with before her disappearance say Jamie was happy and had a real sense of pride in her work. She was happy in her job and she started wearing makeup and um, I seen a photo of her and she had done her hair up. She was dressed really nicely and um, bought new shoes for her job. So those were things that she was looking forward to. So what happened to Jamie Kaiwai? With seemingly little action from police, John Egg began her own investigation. Her koro, who keeps a daily diary, made a note that Jamie was meant to come for dinner on the Tuesday before she disappeared. So you saw her for lunchtime and she was coming back We, we for saw dinner. her at lunchtime and told her to come back uh, for tea. Oh, that was the last time we saw her when she walked out the door there. Five days after Jamie had missed that dinner date with her grandparents, her blue Nissan Tita turned up here at the Tolaga Bay Wharf. It was found by Māori wardens early in the morning. They were here for Tuia 250. So there were boats and waka moored out there in the bay. And locals say there were plenty of people around everywhere. So how did her car turn up here and no one spotted it? And where was Jamie between Tuesday and Sunday? The timeline is confusing. An eyewitness reported seeing Jamie on Friday night near the wharf. Her car wasn't found until Sunday morning but the family was told it wasn't there the night before. On Saturday, the local police was having dinner at his friend's house and he could see the car park and he told me himself that her car wasn't there. And then so the next day on Sunday, the Māori wardens had come to do their checks. This was before five o'clock in the morning and her car wasn't there. But between five and seven after that, her car was there. And that's when the police were called, my papa was contacted and so, and so forth. The family say Jamie's car battery was dying. Her car needed to be started regularly. If you didn't turn it on within 24 hours, or even within 12 hours, her car would die, and she'd always call Papa, Papa, can you come jump start me? And when my Papa went to pick her car up, it didn't even skip a beat. It turned straight on, and immediately my Papa goes, no, nah, her car's been driven, because it was, it turned on straight away. That was suspicious to me and that was suspicious to him and out the rest of our family. Eight weeks after she vanished, police returned Jamie's belongings to the family, including her phone, which had been left in her room. Jonique was shocked to discover the phone had been used after Jamie disappeared. There was some usage after she had been missing, and I told the police, and that gave them enough reason to then go and get a court order for her phone record. But hadn't I have done that, I don't feel like they would have gotten the phone record or would have even locked further in. Mm. What have they said to you about what they found? Nothing. So she dug deeper and eventually cracked the password for Jamie's laptop. So this is a timeline from her like Google account that was connected to her phone and I stumbled across here somehow and then I was able to track 
where she had travelled if she took her phone. What she found was strange. In the weeks leading up to her disappearance, Jamie had been driving long round trips up and down the coast. I can see the distance she travelled and how long it took. So 83 k's up north took an hour and 40, um, and she arrives at Te Aruro. So she didn't stay there for very long. Then a week later, a nine-hour round trip to Hastings. And do you know that location? Well, I know where it is, but I don't know who lives there. And then she stayed for how long? About five minutes. That's right, a nine-hour round trip for just a five-minute stopover. I decided to check out the address where Jamie had visited that night. Well, that was interesting. The family that I spoke to there said they'd been following the Jamie Kaiwai uh, story on Facebook. They didn't know her personally, but they couldn't rule out that other people associated to that house and to that whānau may know something more about her visit. She stopped at these towns, and it's only for a short amount of time, five, ten minutes. Then she's on to the next one, on to the next one, and they're, they're just round trips, and then she just comes home. None of that makes sense to me. She's got no reason to be up there, and especially why would you drive to all these towns for five to ten minutes? What did you suspect was going on? I personally think that she was moving drugs. I could be wrong, but to me, that's what I think she was doing. Mm. What, what do you think of the police response to your cousin's disappearance? I've been disappointed. And, look, I'm not asking them for a miracle. I'm actually just asking for the bare minimum. And I feel like what they've given us isn't even the bare minimum. And that's one of the many reasons she's not prepared to give up her search for Jamie. I can't let go yet because there's too much that's wrong. <laughs> and there's too many things that we could have had answers for if it wasn't for the incompetence of the police. I do feel like a lot of things we could um, had been able to take into account. Had they done those simple things like fingerprints, phone record earlier, and I understand that in some deaths, suicide, whether it's suicide, whether it's foul play, that it's not always going to add up and I might never, ever get what I'm looking for. But I have to try. Kia mō tonu mai rā, te te tiro later in the programme. Jonique Ola, uh, Ole Alai no Uese joins me in studio. But next, please share their views on Jamie's disappearance.
Oraki mai anō. The whānau of missing Tolaga Bay woman Jamie Kaiwai are convinced she's a victim of foul play. They feel police haven't done enough to investigate her case. But police say while Jamie Kaiwai's disappearance is unexplained, it's not suspicious. In 2020, I spoke to the police inspector assigned to Jamie's case. Kia tahura ki tato. The police have told the family that Jamie's disappearance is not suspicious. They've told Jonique it's time to step back and allow the family to grieve. But Jonique and Jamie's grandparents refuse to give up. Some said, hey, hapara tia teni kaupapa. Yeah, yeah, can we teni? Kongaro e wa out. You know, how can you forget a thing like that? This is us, this is our grandchild. Hey, missing. You know, what happens if it happened to you? Would you let it go? Um, we lost on our call. Pick a lot in the morning, the morning, go through and yet, and yet, um, they got it to pop up. With that in mind, I'm going to meet with Inspector Tamuera Abrahama to put the family's questions to police. When we started to look into the story, the Kai Waifano hadn't heard a lot back officially from police. But since we've been looking into it, Janique has recently had a visit from a detective who shared some information with her. I guess my question is, why has it taken so long? I suppose the challenge has been that throughout the course of this investigation to date, there, have not, there has not been one liaison officer. There has been a number of officers from the local cop to the family harm senior sergeant, to the OC investigation, to the search and rescue lead. There have been a number of people engaging with the whānau, the father, with their cousin, um, and with the wider community. But we want to ensure that the whānau are fully kept up to date going forward in this investigation. So what do police think has happened to Jamie Kaiwai? We truly don't know what has happened. Um, we need to keep an open mind. The investigation has always been open. We're awaiting some testing that is coming back from ESR. Everything's been tested. So did you secure the vehicle and secure the room? Did you take the fingerprints and the forensics that are needed? So no, no fingerprints were taken. Uh, obviously items were taken from both the vehicle and the room and those... Why not? Why not fingerprints? Um, that was a decision that was made at the time by the officers. Uh, it was felt that perhaps people had been near and around the vehicle and for, for, that, for that reason it wasn't examined. So normally someone's gone missing, the vehicle's there. Wouldn't it make sense to seize it, to, you know, forensically go through it, take prints from it? And same with her room? So the room was examined? and... Uh, Took fingerprints and... No, no fingerprints were taken from the room, but the room was examined. For, we didn't have a DNA sample for um, Ms Kaiwai, and so we, uh, got, we got some items and we sent those away. Was there anything suspicious in the room? No, there wasn't. Uh, we had officers assigned to uh, do a full scene examination. Uh, there was nothing of suspicion that uh, caused us to be concerned as a result of those examinations. Did they find any blood in her room? Yes. Blood in her room and in the car, yes. Is that not suspicious? Uh, that, that was sent off for uh, testing <clears throat> and we're waiting to hear the results back on those. Did you find anything on those, on the phone and the laptop? So we sent the phone and laptop off to our high-tech crime group in Wellington. They couldn't get into both the phone and the laptop. Um, so they could not get into them. You do realise that Janique was able to get into the laptop almost immediately? When I, I understand that uh, it was through a Google account, uh, through her Google account that she got in. But she was able to open the laptop up, get past the password, and then get into her Google account? Oh, no, I'm not aware of that. But no. the, I guess that... Well, she has, and that's why she's been able to get through the emails and get onto her Facebook and all those kinds of things. So I'm just kind of wondering how much effort was put in by the high tech crime unit at, at police when somebody who's a, you know, a twenty-something old mum can just kind of get in there. Crack As it. I said, I, I understand that she got in through her Google account and into that. That's but how she I was understand. able to actually get into the computer, which I would assume was what your crime unit was trying to do. Absolutely. Would you accept that? People with mental health are also vulnerable to foul play? Absolutely. 
Yes. And could that be the case in this situation? Look, uh, anything's possible, but our investigation to date, and we've spoken to a considerable number of people, have not led us down the path to this being suspicious. Do you think police have done everything they could have done for this whanau? Yes, I do. And uh, my aroha goes out to the whanau. I know uh, there are concerns from the whanau. Uh, we need to remain connected. Uh, I'm more than happy to meet with the whanau and ensure that going forward we remain better connected, uh, perhaps. Um, and my aroha goes out to them. We asked police for an update on Jamie's case and received this statement from Detective Senior Sergeant Kevin Ford, Area Manager, Investigations. It says, Police can confirm that some clothing belonging to Jamie Kaiwai was sent away for forensic testing. The result of this testing was consistent with other evidence and did not raise any new area of concern for police. These results will form part of the information that is provided to the coroner in the future. Other than that, we reiterate our previous statement. The investigation into the disappearance of Jamie Kaiwai remains active and open. However, it is not being treated as suspicious. Once the investigation has concluded, the matter will be referred to the coroner. Please continue to liaise closely with family representatives and encourage anyone with information about the lead-up to Jamie's disappearance to call 105, quoting file number 191014 slash 3116. After the break, we speak to Jamie's cousin, Jonique Ole Alainu'u Esi.
kai te mātake take koutou i a te hui. The whānau of missing Uawa woman, Jamie Kaiwaia adamant she's a victim of foul play and refused to give up their search for answers. Her cousin, John Egg Uli Alai no Uese, has been leading the charge, organising social media campaigns and memorial marches to draw attention to Jamie's story. John Egg has been critical of the police investigation into Jamie's disappearance and she joins me now to update us about her case tēnā kōrua, kō moko kauwai. Yeah. Uh, tēnā whakamaruma mai te kōrero o tō moko kauwai. Uh, I whiwhiau i tōku uh, moko kauwai i te taukoa pahure, um, ko Mark Kōpua tōku uh, kaipa. Um, it was a way, I think for me, Jamie was definitely a, a big part in my decision and the timing of um, receiving my moko kauwai and... Um, I think it's been more of a healing, part of my healing process and receiving and, and she was definitely there on the day. Let's get into the story. Um, in that statement there, police say they have been liaising closely with Fano. Would you accept that? Is, have they been speaking with you, you know? They've been better. So the, the detective that's currently on her case and has been for the past, um, I'm not sure how many months, he has been better than the previous ones and um, I've been a lot happier with his communications with me and also um, he has been more, like he listens to me, mm. he listens to my concerns and he, um, I feel like he's done a better job at following up. Good point. Um, yeah. So we've had a couple of uh, reports, the McCarthy report and the Ford report, since that story went to air, um, with a whole lot of information in there. I, I want to go straight to some of the, the big stuff in there. They, following that story that we did together, um, they finally sent away the clothing mm -hmm. to ESR to be tested and they marked it urgent. Mm -hmm. um, what did they send away? What do you know about that clothing now? I know that they had sent the clothing that was found in Jamie's car, so that was the clothing that had blood on it um, that was wet and dirty. So they had sent that away about five months after her disappearance mm. and marked it as urgent. And um, So I'll just, I'll just run through them. So in the boot we had some grey track pants inside out covered in sand, damp, and a shoe stuck in the leg. We had two hoodies, one in, inside of each other, and there was... Um, there was some blood on the cuffs of that, a black style leather jacket located in the front seat with blood on the sleeves and a black jersey covered in blood. They say it's not suspicious. Yeah, what's your reaction to that? Um, I almost cried when I saw the photos. I always knew that there was um, blooded clothing in the car but I hadn't actually seen what they were and what they had removed as they removed it. And um, so when they finally showed those photos to me, I had to really hold back my tears. Um, and the way that her trousers or her pants were found were inside out. So if you were pulling them off a body, they were that way and with one shoe stuck still inside. Um, I was also told that the, the blood did come from the inside of the cuff, um, again suggesting that she may have Hurt herself. Harmed herself. Mm. Um, Did the police ever suggest that she had been in the water? Yes. So in my last meeting that I had with the police, um, it was Ford who told me that he knows for a fact that she went into the water based off those clothes. But when you know for, how do you know for a fact? Um, was there any, un, you know, what, what's your understanding about how the clothes got back into the boot? Well, that's what I've been asking. How does someone who has... So there was um, blood in the room. So if she's, if she's self-harmed there, she's gone and had to have le left the pub, driven to the wharf where everyone was getting ready for 2 or 2.50. She would have had to got out, walked into the water, decided, oh, I'm going to take my clothes off walked back to the car, t taken her clothes off, mm. and then went to drown herself. You know, like, none of that makes sense to me, mm. and I don't think that makes sense to anyone. And in terms of recovering any evidence, like you say, there was one shoe in the, in the, in the, in the pants, but there's been no shoe, other shoe recovered. Yeah. Is there anything, has the community seen anything, any sign of um, her tenana, her tupapaku, a shoe, clothing? So, She's just vanished. 
And, and how's um, your papa, Eru, and, and your nan? How are they feeling about the, the responses to this investigation? I think that they, they're heartbroken, obviously, but I just try and reassure them. Mm. I know him, my. Um, one of the last things in that report, um, Inspector McCarthy concludes that Jamie was, and this is a quote, his, was an unwell drug dependent woman who was depressed. Yeah. That's been mummy for you, you guys, eh? Um, what's your, you know, what, what do you, when you read that, what did you think? I was disappointed, but again, I was disappointed, but I wasn't surprised. Like when we look at how they've treated her case from the beginning, for him to say that is not a surprise to me. They didn't know her and she actually was released. They, they got it in their reports that she had gone insane. Yes, yeah, she was released from um, community yeah. health when, when she had been yeah. um, admitted when you, when a year before. So she was actually free. I think the report yeah. said that she was happy and healthy and she was doing really well yeah. a month before she disappeared. I guess the police uh, say the case is open, um, but they don't think it's suspicious. Do you think you'll ever be able to, you know, what do you need to be able to accept that perhaps Jamie has just gone missing? I can't accept it. Not with the evidence that's presented. And it's not that I can't accept that she may have committed suicide, that I can accept if there was evidence to say to me and to my whanau, we believe she committed suicide because of these findings. All the findings that we've been shown lead to the opposite. And so the reason that I carry this on, because one, my cousin's not found. She's no one knows where she is. Two, there's all of the it's all the evidence is inside the police reports that I've actually had for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. But I've been waiting for them to I've been waiting to see what they're gonna do, how they're gonna react. Um, and, and we're going to keep waiting with you and keep on that journey with you, Kanu Tina. Kinakui etitua hine. Uh etitua kanakua hikina te hui um tine po ma pai mariri kia tato katoa. with support from New Zealand On Air.